process. Um, whole bunch of announcements. Uh, first and foremost, uh, many of you requested an extension on the requirements gathering project assessment. We think we have given extensions to everyone who asked for them. If we have not, please post a new Piazza post because it got lost in somebody's email or something like that. Um, your team agreements should all be complete. Is that correct? Yes? No? Has anybody submitted them all? Everyone submitted team agreements? No? Okay, so I feel like that prod, I feel like that assignment is closed. So. That, was, that was in class, right? No, this is the real one. But I also may be mixing up classes. So, all right, I will I will check into that and post something in Piazza uh, explaining it. Uh, Get intro workshop. Uh, we just decided to make that uh, due end of next week. Uh, it really, if it takes you an hour, I'd be stunned. Um, so there's that. Uh, we're going to start working on midterm presentations uh, next Thursday. I'll show you some examples of what I expect in it. And then most of the class will be uh, being able to work on your teams as to, to start working on it, basically. Uh, we do not have class on Tuesday. Um, so Tuesday is a Monday schedule. So while we don't have class, don't forget to go to your Monday classes. Um, as it's a Monday schedule, we have, we I think it's just Harsh has his office hours normally on Monday. So he will be holding his Monday office hours on Tuesday. So whatever his time is on Monday is what it will be on Tuesday. Make sense? Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, what was the attendance for again? It's here. Oh, okay. <clears throat> any other questions? All right. So today we're going to do basically a brief kind of overview of security, except kind of uh, like some of it's going to be tech related, but it's kind of like uh, security is is an entire field, right? As you may or may not know, um, uh, and it covers a vast majority of things. Right? It covers like a huge expanse of things. Um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit at broad strokes about what uh, the kind of security space in general, and then uh, kind of a little bit more narrowly focused on what a typical programmer needs to know about security and about where it applies to your applications. But please, like, please remember, I am just scratching the surface. Uh, the, uh, this is an incredibly hot field. Some of the people who I think are the smartest and best programmers I know um, are deep in this field. There's a lot of really interesting stuff going on there. Uh, just to kind of give one example that's taking place at uh, Boston University, this concept of what's called multi-party computing, which is where you have, like, let's say you want to make a, like a predicted algorithm or something, um, but you have data sources from groups that can't or don't want to share data. So how can you combine the data with, uh, without anybody ever being able to see any individual pieces of data? So one example of this, um, which hopefully I haven't brought up with you because I hate telling the same story twice, but um, Uber and Lyft uh, were asked by the city of Boston to give them uh, an indication of where the most drop-offs were because the city of Boston, like many other cities uh, actually around the world, have been trying to figure out what to do about car share, you know, ride share services and the fact that they muck up roads when they double park and things like that. So that's why Boston was interested. Obviously, Uber and Lyft definitely do not want to share data with each other and they don't even really want to share data with Boston. So one of the mechanisms used was this MPC thing uh, and they were able to successfully figure out where the most drop-off locations were without ever the data being seen by any of the three parties that went into the calculation. Basically. Uh, lo and behold, uh, the corner up the street from me is the most popular drop-off location in all of the city of Boston. Um, which we ever heard, anybody here to the bar Lincoln or Loco? They're across the street from each other. So right in front of Lincoln in Southie, that's, uh, that's the most popular drop-off location in the city. So let's see. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, you know, it runs the whole gamut from mathematics to uh, programming, et cetera. So if you're interested, I strongly encourage finding out more. Come and talk to me. I can tell you at least where to get started or hook you up with people who can tell you a lot more. So 
broad strokes. Um, first thing is we're talking about buzzwords, acronyms, slang that is often used when you talk about security. So OSINT or OSINT, I normally hear it said OSINT, but I've also, I have occasionally heard OSINT. Uh, but this is open source intelligence. So basically this is where you are able to go and discover information uh, in a public place that compromises security somehow. So whenever you accidentally post that Amazon key to GitHub, that would be an example, okay? Um, some people will also put um, social engineering in here, but I'm gonna put that further on. Uh, so, but just basically it's publicly available. All you gotta do is scour the internet and uh, people write very sophisticated botware to do that um, so that you can collect this information. So that's one type. Another one, this is uh, human usually, uh, and this is human intelligence. So if you think of any spy novel you've ever read or heard of, uh, you know, or any spy movies or whatever, that's normally what human is, okay? So basically human intelligence where you are um, basically uh, capitalizing on how people work in order to compromise security, okay? So this might be what's, you may know what I mean when if I say uh, we turned someone. Know that term? What does it mean? It means when you get them on your side. Right, which, but against their actual side, right? Uh, so, you know, an American spy turns a Russian spy and now, um, you know, in the Cold War and, and now they're telling you information about, uh, the, in those days, the USSR. Um, you know, to American intelligence, for example. Uh, the ones that more commonly affect us are these two, social engineering and phishing. Okay, social engineering is, generally speaking, um, I call a company and I tell them that I work for IT. Like, so I call somebody individually in the company, I tell them I work for IT and that I need their password in order to fix their computer. Okay, at, a, at the most rudimentary sense. Um, and basically what you're doing is relying on social norms to collect information. So people tend to be polite, people tend to be nice. And so when you're a social engineer you capitalize on that and, and steal information that way, okay? Uh, phishing, anybody know what phishing is? Really? Okay. Kind of, it's usually more sophisticated than that, but yes. Um, like, for example, someone sends an email with the, uh, you bring it to like a login form, and as you, they basically like set up a fake site for you to do it. Right. You your info. So let's see. What was this? Uh, Saturday and Sunday, I thought they were all like really together, but they're not. Uh, so my citizen's card has been suspended for this SMS, and I uh, want to continue. I can go to this URL that is ptnol.app.link slash ebnwu. Uh, I do not have a citizen's bank account, much less a credit card, right? Um, so what this is doing is trying to get me to click on this link, um, thereby proving this happens to be an SMS mechanism, right? Um, thereby proving I exist and my phone number is live. So therefore they can collect that into their database of people who future scan. Um, the reason I was talking about with like email in particular, um, because of the advent of HTML email, I can put a URL in an email that says, you know, dub, dub, dub dot, um, you know, your actual bank.com. And when you click on it, I can give you a completely different URL because there's no relationship between, like, if you see this as a link, that doesn't mean that the link underneath it is, and that is the same link. It's just custom to do so. Okay, so a phishing email will often do that. Um, I think, and uh, Matt's not here yet, uh, I think it was him, I can't remember, but so somebody I know um, was working in IT in their company, you know, whatever, and they decided to test the phishing, uh, you know, internally. Um, and they literally had nearly 100% failure, including IT staff and like tech people. Okay, so 
be cautious of this, okay? You you all are just as likely to fall for it as anybody else. Um, so, you know, before you click on that link in your email, mouse over it, see where it's gonna go um, before clicking on it. All right, questions, make sense? All right, SIGINT. Now this is the category that like dates itself in a sense, um, but this is what, we actually call this stuff that when a programmer normally says security, what it is. This is actually under signals intelligence. Uh, it goes way back in the day to like radio uh, signals. Um, when you're trying, you know, this would be, you know, uh, whatever, let's say in the 1940s, you know, trying to capture information by collecting radio signals from opposing parties. Okay. So that's where like the class comes from, but now it's basically been applied to like anything tech related. Okay. So I find this one particularly confusing. Maybe you all don't, but like signals and computers do not, are not in the same box for me at all. So uh, that's why I bring it up. Yeah. Is this SIGINT also just like an important signal name? Like, like you can call SIGINT. Um, I don't understand. Like that's SIGINT is just the name of the signal. Right, like interrupt. Oh, it is. Sorry, it is also that, yeah, but that is a, a weird, different weird naming thing. Yeah. So, um, but that uh, the expansion for SIG in SIGINT with the interrupt, I think is. I don't think it's signal. Really? Oh, okay. But I, I think I'm wrong. Um, but so <clears throat> there's a concept on computers called interrupts. Okay. So every time you hit a key on your keyboard. Um, generally speaking, like 99, 95% of the time, when you hit a key on your keyboard, it will interrupt whatever is going on in the computer, okay? And that's why you can get out of something by hitting control C, right? Because it will interrupt the process even if that process is done right away. And the reason is, is because of a concept in computers called interrupts. And what an interrupt is, exactly what it sounds like, it interrupts whatever is going on. And most of the time, interrupts take the highest priority in the system so that you always have kind of control C available, basically. All the different kinds of interrupts have different names. One of them is SIGINT, for example, they're usually shortened. Um, but like I said, I thought the SIG there meant to uh, sit for something else, but you could very well be right. I'd have to look it up. All right, so moving on. So obviously, we are mostly going to talk about SIGINT. Um, but what I want to talk about is kind of the most common examples of where you have security holes in your code. Uh, easily, the biggest, most likely reason you have a security hole is because you have a bug, okay? Uh, these are somewhat harder these days to write a good enough bug that it actually causes a real security hole. So because uh, you know, most of the popular programming languages or whatever don't have things like uh, buffer overflows that much anymore, okay? Or, is there, is, who, you all know what a buffer overflow is? All right, so a buffer overflow traditionally will, um, it, it halts the process, and because it's halting the process, it means you can like backdoor into it inside. When you're talking about a web server, uh, that gets a lot more complicated. So if you can even get Python to buffer overflow, you're actually doing it because of the C libraries underneath, it's, it's significantly more complicated. So um, it's much harder to write bugs that have security holes uh, that are the traditional ones that you might have heard about before, like a buffer overflow. However, it is still just as easy to write wide gaping holes, okay? So for example, my brother works for a library in their IT department or whatever. They have a product, like an off the shelf product that they bought um, that he noticed one day started to seem to be uh, creating new files on disk when he knew that all the users weren't using it and couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, turns out uh, the registration process for a new account, which would let you write content to disk uh, was wide open. So, uh, you know, he, you know, he figured that people, somebody wrote a script that's actually registering new users and using that new user to write content, right? So then he went and turned on the feature that turned on captcha. You all know what captcha is? 
you kind of experienced it, right? But uh, so you turn that on, thinks the capture is working. However, the data keeps getting created. Then he discovers that the back end doesn't actually check whether the capture was successful or not. <laughs> so very easy to still write wide open security holes, even if they aren't uh, something sophisticated like buffer <laughs> overflows. OK, next most common SQL injection. Um, why? I don't know, presentation mode. I don't know. I don't know what my next slide is. I hate that. Hold on a second. What class is this? What day is it? Uh, let's see. How that can be feisty. Um, oh, I did it again. I do this all the time. This is why I never do agenda slides, because I just don't ever move past the agenda slide. Sorry, especially when I can't see what my next slide is. Uh, but I don't know if I would have thought of my brother example, except that it happened like literally this week, I think, maybe it was last week. Um, but so here's some examples of bug uh, scenarios, right? So input validation, especially across platform, this is a huge one, uh, especially if you start doing mixed languages. So as soon as you start having to use like Unicode characters, things like that, um, that's where you tend to have a lot of code bugs, right? Uh, so be careful if you're incorporating translation, for example, into an application. Uh, that is a big opportunity to make big, huge mistakes. Um, and then broken authentication or authorization. My brother example actually is one of these, um, uh, which is funny because I wrote this before I heard that story. Um, and then consistent tests. That's the biggest. That's the biggest way to solve for this problem. Is have tests on your code that are regularly run that are good. Although that's kind of true for most of these. So, okay. So here's SQL injection. This is why I was looking um, because everybody likes little Bobby tables. Um, so, who here has heard of a SQL injection? Okay. So basically what you're doing is you're relying on two things when you're trying to hack the system using SQL injection. One, that you can guess what their back end looks like, okay? Sorry. <coughs> Which is traditionally not very hard, okay? Because most applications have a database behind it that is relational, that relies on SQL, okay? That is getting less true now, but it's still pretty common. The other thing that you're relying on is that the uh, front end of the application, and when I say front end, I want to be very, very clear. There's both the like HTML front end, so like that UI, but also the API. Okay, so this is my brother's example. The HTMI, the HTML could have did input validation by incorporating that captcha, but the API didn't care. So all they had to do was write a script like using Postman or curl or whatever that would just hit that directly. And in fact, they probably were never touching the HTML to begin with, right? Like, why did you write a script that has to go and fill in a website when you don't have to, right? Because it's a lot more work than just writing curl post. Um, so what you're doing here is you're guessing the syntax of the SQL that's going to insert this record or whatever. And so you basically, you know, this, this part's a joke, but basically you close the string, then you close the, the insert statement or whatever, then you put in a semicolon, because that's how SQL delineates new lines, then you put in something destructive, okay? And if you can, what you do when you're trying to make this work, right, is you um, mess around with this part and mess around with your destructive statements until something works. Right? So you basically just keep hitting it until you get a guess back. Because usually somebody who won't check for this will also give you the error. Right? So if you get back table students doesn't exist, okay, well then I know my code's working. So instead what I'm going to do is select star from tables and find out what tables it does have. Turns out, hey, guess what? They have a users table. Okay, drop table users. Make sense? So, like I said, usually these rely on some guessing about the back end. Actually, most security, like most attackers, that's mostly what they're doing. They're guessing what's going on. Um, 
So two parts to that, right? One is, you know, don't make a mistake in the first place by not testing the inputs. But second, don't give them any information about whether or not uh, it worked. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to try and ask a question that you can answer, but it's going to be hard to articulate in a way that makes any sense. So if you go to a website and you can't remember your password, you go and click the forgot password link. Uh, it takes you to a new page and it says enter your email address to reset your password. Okay. What is the typical or the right result from that action aside from getting the email? So, isn't it like um, they send you like the group, like the, they send you the email and then uh, click on it and it tells you to make a new password? It doesn't tell you like what your old password is because if they tell you the old password, that means they saved their password. That is a very good point, but not actually the one I was going for, but it is a good point. Uh, so, that is right. What I was really talking about was when you hit that submit button, the next web page you get. So not irrelevant to the actual reset password activity. What's the typical response you get or what should it be? How about you in the back? Uh, sometimes, but usually they, they give you a confirmation. It's like email has been sent to email if the account exists or something. Exactly. And the key word is if the account exists. So in other words, you get the same exact message, whether it's a real account, or whether it's one you just made up to test their forgot password code, right? So keep that kind of stuff in mind is that the less information you can give an attacker about the environment they're attacking, the better, including whether or not this account exists, right? Because if I know the account exists, well, now I can brute force a password, right? So uh, one of my machines at home, actually, uh, until I kind of rearranged some of the security stuff on it, would just get slammed all the time with attacks, right? Like just constant. Um, and that's part of why like, I locked down a lot more of it. It's a lot less useful now, which is super annoying, but you know, I don't have to deal with it. But the range of account names that they thought I would have was just mind blowing. Like just my, I was like, why? Like, they just try like every common name and let's go with that as a, as a username. Uh, it was just really interesting. Okay, so cross-site scripting. Um, say my note, system. It's like when there's like a input on a website and it puts like JavaScript inside it. Yeah, so basically, it, it's it, if you think about it and, to, and read the expansion carefully, right? It's exactly what it sounds like, okay? It's basically code that is launching from one website and attacking another. But from a user experience perspective, it looks like one web page, okay? Most, I would say for cross-site scripting, your most common interaction with this these days will be defeating it to make your programs work, okay? Because most applications work this way, right? If you want to use some JavaScript library coming from the Google distribution network, for example, um, that's cross-site scripting, right? So you have to do it the right way, otherwise a browser is going to flag it as an error. Um, but it's, it's pretty uncommon these days to actually get cross-site scripting that actually works, uh, at least in my experience. Um, and then related, right, is cross-site request forgery, um, which allows them to perform actions that they don't intend to. So basically it's like, you know, if you click the button and it sends a curl request to my brother's website, right, and creates a new user. Okay, so it's kind of, that's kind of the idea is like, it's almost like a phishing game. It's like you perform an action as a user, but it's an action that takes permissions. Okay. And so I have to be a logged in permission user or whatever. And so what happens is like all, if you can somehow embed some JavaScript in there somehow or whatever, you're, you make it so that when I click the button, instead of doing what the button does that I think it does, it actually makes another request by overriding the JavaScript that's on the button. Does this make sense? So when we get to the end, I'm gonna show you a tool where you can actually go and experiment with all of these which I think really makes them a lot clearer. So uh, it, it, they're very, you know, like most security things, they're, they're difficult to talk about in the abstract um, because, you know, there's a lot of very talented attackers out there.
All right. So what I also wanted to ask was, what others have you ever heard of? Any ideas? Let's check my next slides. All right, anybody know of any others? All right, well, you can find out more by, theoretically, the next slide. If I can figure out how to switch it. So we're actually gonna, let's see if I can get this to work right. Uh, So as I recall, there was a reading to go look at OWASP, right? Did you already do that? Am I misremembering it? Okay, so OWASP is this organization that I cannot remember ever what the expansion is. Um, it's like Open Web, oh, well, Open Web Application Security Project, maybe? I don't know, I can't remember what it is. Um, but, this is a really good like resource for both kind of discovering what kind of the latest is in attacks, um, but also if you go and read these top 10, this top 10 list, let me scroll. Um, why is nothing working for me today? Where's my stupid notes? If you kind of go read, so one time, kind of go read the detail of these top 10 web application security groups. And then if you kind of go revisit it every month or two, and to remind yourself of the kinds of things that uh, to look for. Because almost all of the problems are things that you cause in your code. Okay, like there are ways to solve these problems for almost every security, you know, issue, if you know that it's a problem. The hard part is there's no panacea. Like there's no way for me to say, if you do A, you will get a SQL injection bug. So don't do A, okay? Like it's just, I cannot be specific enough to tell you when you're doing it wrong. So basically what I have to do is I have to see your code and I can look at it and go, you know, SQL injections there. Don't do that, right? Um, but I can't tell you there's some magic glowing rule that just works. So what that means is as developers, you must educate yourself in kind of the most common vulnerabilities so that when you're writing your own code, you kind of have them somewhere banging around in the back of your brain uh, and you avoid it, okay? You also should have other people look at your code uh, so that they can see the problems in your code. But the first step is you should know what these are most of the time, okay? Like I said, you don't have to look at it every day. You don't have to look at it even, I would say, you know, looking at it once a month is probably more than enough. And you'll also get a sense as you get more experience, how often you need to refresh your knowledge on these subjects. But it is very important um, and it's very hard. Uh, so, does that make sense? Questions? All right. All right. Uh, like I said, I thought I had listed it as a, uh, like a, a reading, but I could be crazy. Um, where, next thing I want to talk about is, CVEs. All right. Anyone who is not an intern at Red Hat or ever was an intern at Red Hat, do you know what a CVE is? It might even say on the board somewhere. I don't know. Anyone? All right. CVE is a. Let's see if I sound like someone. All right. Anybody who was at Red Hat, can you tell me what it is? 
Uh, do you know what a CDE is? Well, I see the description in the middle of the board. I'd only heard about it like tangentially. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, common vulnerability error. Now I'm blanking what the E stands for. Uh, I, uh, I'll look it up. What exploit? Yeah, it, that seems like an over the same term again, right? Um, but completely blanking what the E stands for. Uh, yeah, I know all that. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll uh, like I said, I'll get out at the end because I think we're going to be done kind of early and then, uh, but I won't waste our time now. But so this database is all known security vulnerabilities uh, for most software. Uh, and they need to rise to like a certain level of prevalence, okay? But they get on there pretty fast. So, and a couple of things happened. So does anybody remember Heartbleed? It made a lot of public like general news. So Heartbleed is um, a bug that happened, that got a cool name, but really was, and let me just see, and what I usually do is I have a, like a CDE um, like example. Normally when I talk about this, but of course I don't today because it's a day. Is there anything here that'll just show us a stupid CD? Um, oh, let's do that one. <clears throat> like usually I deep link into it, but um, these are events. Look, you go to like CD clubs. Ah. I don't know. So. That one. So basically, it's just this well-structured format for defining what a, an error is, so that um, so that there's like a global clearinghouse, so that if Red Hat discovers a bug, Microsoft will also know about it. Okay. Um, sometimes a CVE gets what's called embargo. Okay, and when it's embargo, that means only people who are directly involved in fixing it. Are allowed to know it exists. That makes sense because until they have a patch ready, they don't want to tell anybody that this bug is out there because it's, it's going to be bad news. Um, that is very uncommon um, and should be as it should also try to stay very uncommon. Why do you think embargoed CVEs or embargoed bugs are bad? Any theories? Yeah. How to be open source security thing where if it's embargoed, fewer eyes are trying to solve it. So that is definitely part of it. And What's it be taken advantage of if it's like black hat shared? Right. So so two there's two parts to that second part. <laughs> so one is the more people you get working on a bug, the more likely you'll have not only faster but also better fixes. Okay. The other part is just because you embargoed it doesn't mean the entire bad guy community doesn't know about it, right? It just means that you haven't told the, the good guy community, right? So that's another part. And then kind of lastly, there's also the embarrassment factor, okay? So if I run an IT shop and a CVE has shown up here, I should get fired if I have something that's vulnerable to it. Right? Maybe not immediately, you know, like obviously if it, if it came out in like zero day, we get exploited. There's definitely a question there. But if there's a CVE in here that's been there for a year and I run an application, like I'm the head of the IT department and we run that application and it has that CVE and it gets exploited, I should be fired. Okay? So, embarrassment factor, like, or, you know, somebody looking out for themselves factor, you know, whatever you want to call it. The more public we make the information, the more likely people will incorporate the bug fix. That makes sense? So usually embargo bugs are a bad idea. Um, now on the flip side, um, none of you will remember this, but uh, some number of years ago, uh, so do you remember like, in the, well, like the very first or second lecture I talked about DNS? And basically DNS is like the backbone of the internet, right? If DNS is not working correctly, 
bad stuff happens, okay? Because like talking about phishing attacks, right? If I can replace the resolver for a domain name, even if I look at it and it says google.com, it's still taking me somewhere else, right? So that's why DNS hacks are really dangerous. So some number of years ago, I want to say like 10, maybe it was a bit more, um, it was discovered that there was a very easy way to exploit DNS at a global level. So they literally, like this was embargoed, there were like seven people in the entire world who knew about this problem. And they flew them all to, I'm gonna say, I wanna say it was in California, um, to try to figure out what to do about it. Because not only was it relatively easy to exploit uh, and wicked damaging, but also not easy to fix. Uh, and so if you're ever interested, there was a really good uh, like kind of consumer level wired article about what happened. Um, and it's, uh, like I thought it was fascinating, really interesting. And I'm not, like I said before, I'm not really a security guy, right? So it's not like, it's not deep security tech, but trying to figure out how to solve this problem was a big deal. And have you ever heard of um, security in this? So like I may have mentioned it, I don't bring it up too much because it's, uh, it's quite complicated, but actually kind of part of that problem instigated uh, security NS, which is basically that now there's a lot more like certificate matching between my computer and the DNS server to prove that everybody says who they say they are, or everybody is who they say they are, so that makes sense. All right, so CVEs. Uh, <clears throat> Something to know, all right? This is something, you know, if you become an IT administrator, this is a place you should go regularly. If you are a programmer, this is a place you kind of check out periodically, right? Or go and dig up a CVE because you think you're vulnerable for it, like you hear about it. Um, but normally, like I said, I wish I could find an example one for you, but normally a CVE is CVE dash, and then I think it's an eight numeric string, or like eight, numbers um and but some cool ones get names like heartbleed or there were a bunch of other ones uh in recent years if that's the one i think of um so okay next uh this one i think is hilarious so that's partially why we're going to talk about it so this is the big list of naughty strings so basically, it's like you know, literally a big list of strings that commonly break web, but like websites. Okay, so so like our stupid example of a SQL injection from XKCD, that would be in here, kind of idea. Okay, and uh, and there's some, you know, I freely admit I'm a super nerd, but there's some near nerdy funny stuff in here if you just check it out. There is also a whole bunch of questionable content. Uh, so, you know, if you're easily offended, be aware. But, and why I'm not actually going to open it up and show it. But the, uh, but there is a lot of really good examples. Um, and, you know, having a test or something where you can actually throw the naughty string list at your uh, system is not a bad thing to be able to do. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to grade your projects on Okay. These are all linked, by the way, in the uh, slides from today. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to show you, there's a couple more links on the slides, but I'm not going to talk about them today, um, is this, I think, ridiculously cool project, which is XVWA. It is a badly coded web application written in, and this should have been the first hint, PHP in MySQL. Uh, that helps security and third enthusiasts to learn application security. I think it has screenshots. Uh, I think the last time I talked about this, I actually had a running instance to show off, but I don't have one today. Um, but basically, it has like this table, and you say, Oh, what is an OS command injection? And then it gives you a description, and then it shows you a bunch of examples, and then you can actually run the web server and actually try it. Okay, so you can see exactly what happens. Um, does anybody know what it is? I think that's small enough that you can't actually read it. Anyone want to guess what an OS command injection is? Yep. 
Think about it on OS feeds, it's, it, and it's a lot easier to figure out. Yeah. You can run operating system commands. Right. Injections. So uh, some program, uh, some uh, like websites, um, do various things where they actually interact with the actual file system, with the actual operating system. Uh, and so as a result, there's an opportunity, just like a SQL injection, to inject rm-rf slash uh, and have it execute on the actual file system. Um, I actually wrote a system that, uh, like, it didn't have this problem, but what it did was uh, when he never did searches, you typed in all your parameters for the search, and then it would actually generate Perl code on the command line and then execute Perl code to do the search. Um, so we had to be really careful that you couldn't OS inject uh, commands, right? Why did we write Perl code on the fly to do the searches? Because eh, it was cool. Um, so I think that was it. Questions? Okay. Uh, let me see. I feel like there's a, another slide. Oh, yeah. So moving on slightly to something completely different. Uh, I need to get like one of those like super huge, uh, you know, like you click the button and it makes your mouse super huge. Then maybe I can see it. Oh, I forgot that link's not gonna work. Anyway. Oops. Okay, so um, this came up in conversation with one of the Spark people that, um, we talked about choosing your stack for your project uh, kind of in the first lecture. There, there is a recording of it. It's on the YouTube playlist if you want to go watch it. Um, but I'm not sure that I ever actually said, here's the recommended stack. Um, and so what I wanted to show you, and again, this link is in the slide, so you don't need to like copy it, um, but you can if you want, um, is basically, Here's what Spark is recommending for your stack if you have a choice. Okay, a lot of the projects uh, have prior art, so you don't really have a lot of choice. But this is what we can usually help you with and what we think is probably the best bet. Okay, So React uh, and TypeScript um, is kind of for the front end. And then also what we're trying to do here is start to collect, uh, you know, getting started. Uh, you know, some various resources. One of the other things that we want to start doing is actually having the, like, uh, the next time we're doing a React workshop, try to have a link here or stuff. So hopefully this, this continues to improve. If you have content that you would like to help here, uh, we would really appreciate it. You can just do a PR. Um, so React, TypeScript are our kind of recommendation on the front end. Um, on mobile, we've been uh, recommending Flutter, uh, which not only does uh, cross-platform, sorry, Android and Apple, but actually does uh, Windows native apps and uh, web apps now too, I think. I, some of that might be in beta, but I can't remember. Um, uh, and so, the reason we're recommending Flutter is the docs are really, really good and it's cross platform. So, check that out. From a back end perspective, uh, we kind of are recommending uh, uh, this is missing information. Um, so, Firebase for kind of like if you want an API combined with a database. And if you need a traditional relational database, Postgres, and we'll get you a Postgres uh, database instance, so you don't have to like manage it yourself. Um, and then MongoDB for if you really want a document store. Um, then if you prefer Python, uh, we've been recommending Flask or Fast API. Uh, Fast API is kind of a new kid in the block. Um, and uh, is kind of poised to take over from Flask, but we'll see. Uh, but either one of those is totally fine. And then Node.js, um, if you're building a website, you actually want Node.js plus Express. Uh, Express is a plugin for Node.js. 
because uh, as many people don't, do not realize, Node.js is actually not designed or good at being a web server. Uh, so instead, there, somebody wrote a plugin called Express that makes it into one instead of just using, you know, Nginx or Apache. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I like Node.js a lot. I don't know why people use it for web servers. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of tell you this was there, and this is our recommendation. And what we're trying to grow, like inside Spark, the Spark group, is that we have at least some expertise in all these things, or we know people who do. So if you run into problems, we can help you. Um, so particularly with uh, like React and CSS, also there's the course assistance. So with uh, Camilla can help you with that uh, primarily. And then on the back end side, if you want to talk about like generalization or some of the Flash stuff, um, I think I think it was Flash. You might also do, you might do Node.js, I can't remember which, uh, but Drago is the other course assistance, uh, you know, but then we kind of know the rest of it. Our Flutter is still pretty weak, um, just because we haven't done a whole lot of mobile apps in general. Cool, questions? All right, you know what I did not do? Oh no, I did, theoretically, maybe, recording this call, hopefully I did, or this meeting, or this lecture, whatever this thing is. All right, let me see if there was anything else on my list. But as you can tell, I am still unable to use a computer. Okay, so just same announcements. Just make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if it was relevant to any of you. Um, does anybody here interested in machine learning? Okay, so uh, my organization, right? So the uh, Faculty for Computing and uh, Data Science or whatever we're called, uh, we're actually doing faculty search right now. And as part of that activity, we invite people to give lectures uh, about their research, about stuff they're doing. There's a whole mess of really good ones. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to go. Uh, in my other two classes, which have a direct correlation to machine learning, I'm actually giving out extra credit for going. Um, but I can't justify that here because not all of you are interested in machine learning. Um, so, but it's still a really cool list. Uh, as there were a fair number of people who were interested, I'll post a Piazza note with a link to all the events uh, so you can see when they're. But basically, like the next, it's like from now until like uh, basically spring break, there's like a talk nearly every other day. Um, and like I saw one of them a couple of days ago, it was awesome, really good. So I definitely encourage you to attend to that. But uh, I think that's it for today. We got done a little early. Um, what I should do is for this talk, I should have one of my crazy security friends come and do some of it. And we can just like, we can parcel out a time for them and just say, this is all you can talk about. Uh, and then just watch him go nuts. Uh, all right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, yeah, just don't forget, no class on Tuesday. So uh, you can come if you want, but we won't be here. For the uh, team agreement, you said you're going to post like the class first. I'll go dig up whatever. I thought it was, I thought it was on uh, Green Scope. I thought it was already due. I thought you would have all done it. But like I said, I must be mixing it up with the other class. So I'll go figure out whatever is wrong with my brain and I'll post something to Piazza.